Welcome to an example on how to solve an initial value problem involving a second order homogeneous Cauchy-Euler differential equation. So in order to solve the initial value problem, the first thing we probably should recognize is that we have a second order differential equation and also that it's homogeneous because the right side is equal to zero. But more importantly for this example, since the given differential equation fits this form here, it's a Cauchy-Euler differential equation which gives us a specific strategy in order to solve the differential equation. It's a Cauchy-Euler differential equation because for each term in the differential equation, the degree of the coefficient is equal to the order of the derivative. For example, looking at the first term, notice how we have ax squared, so the degree of the coefficient is two. The term also contains the second derivative. Looking at the second term, we have b times x, where x is to the first power, so the coefficient is degree one, and the term also contains the first derivative. And finally, the third term is a constant times y. So because our differential equation fits this form, we can solve it using this auxiliary equation here, where the values of a, b, and c come from the differential equation, and then based upon the type or nature of roots to this quadratic equation, it will affect the form of the general solution. Let's start by identifying the values of a, b, and c. Notice that a would be one, b would also be one, and c would also be one. So using the auxiliary equation, a m times the quantity m minus one plus b times m plus c equals zero, we'll substitute the values for a, b, and c, and then solve the quadratic equation. So we'd have one times m, or just m, times the quantity m minus one, plus one times m, or just m, plus one equals zero. Now let's clear the parentheses and combine like terms. We'd have m squared minus m plus m plus one equals zero. Notice how this would simplify to zero. So now we just have m squared plus one equals zero, or we can write m squared equals negative one. And now to solve for m, we'll take the square root of both sides of the equation. So we have square root m squared equals plus or minus the square root of negative one, which is equal to i. So now we know that m is equal to plus or minus i. But I'm gonna go ahead and write this as m equals zero plus or minus one i, because when the auxiliary equation has complex solutions, we want to be able to identify the value of alpha and beta, where the solutions are in the form of alpha plus or minus beta i. So for our equation, notice that alpha is equal to zero and beta is equal to positive one. And again, just to review, because we have complex solutions to the auxiliary equation, this is the form of the general solution. Remember, if we had two distinct real roots, this would be the form of the general solution. If we had two real equal roots, this would be the form of the general solution. So going back to our example, we now know that the general solution would be y of x equals, we'd have x to the zero power, which is equal to one. So we can leave that off. We would just have c sub one times cosine of beta times natural log x, but beta is one, so it's just natural log x, plus c sub two sine natural log x. But remember, we're not done. While this is a general solution, our goal is to find a particular solution based upon the initial conditions. So now we need to find c sub one and c sub two using the fact that y of one equals one and y prime of one equals two. Let's do this on the next slide. Let's begin by using the fact that y of one equals one, which means when we substitute one for x, this function must equal positive one. So we'd have c sub one cosine natural log one, which would be zero, plus c sub two sine of, again, natural log one, which is zero, and this must equal positive one. And since sine zero is equal to zero, and cosine zero is equal to one, 
this tells us that C sub one must equal one. So we know that C sub one is equal to positive one, but we still have to find C sub two. To do this, we use the fact that Y prime of one equals two. So let's start by finding Y prime. So if this is Y, then to find Y prime, we'll have to apply the chain rule. Y prime of X is gonna be equal to, well the derivative of cosine U would be negative sine U times U prime. So we'll have C sub one times negative sine natural log X times the derivative of natural log X, which would be one over X plus C sub two times the derivative of sine u, which would be cosine u times u prime, or cosine natural log x times the derivative of natural log x, which is one over x. So y prime of x is equal to negative c sub one sine natural log x divided by x plus c sub two cosine natural log x divided by x. So let's take our derivative function to the next slide and then use the fact that y prime of one equals two. So if y prime of one equals two, we'll substitute one for x and set our function equal to two. So we would have negative c sub one sine natural log one, which is zero, divided by one plus c sub two cosine natural log one, which is zero, divided by one equals two. Well again, sine zero is equal to zero, so this term simplifies out. Cosine zero is equal to one, and therefore we now know that C sub two equals positive two. Now that we know C sub two equals two, and C sub one equals positive one, we'll perform substitution for C sub one and C sub two into our general solution to find the particular solution. Our particular solution will be y of x equals one cosine natural log x plus two sine natural log x. So again, y of x equals cosine natural log x plus two sine natural log x. This would be the solution to the initial value problem. I hope you found this explanation helpful.